Call to order the April 17, 2019 meeting of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Are there any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, uh, next item is a period for public comment relating to items that are not otherwise on the agenda. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on any such items? Hearing none, and there's uh, no consent agenda, we'll move on to approval of the March 20 minutes. Is there a motion to approve? Second. So we have Catherine, and the second was? Jim. Jim. Trying to help Amy out. She asked me to not use my usual blah, 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 blah approach to this, so. Um, are there any corrections, comments, questions? I have one correction. I, I think that, um our representative from Colchester was here. Colchester is working in Babson, but Jeff Bartley told me he would be here, and um, Kelly thinks maybe he came in late. Got to check the tape, I guess. Yep. I, I, he told me he was coming, so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll verify. Any other? Comments, corrections? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? I will abstain. Yeah, any, ab and any abstentions? Raise your hand. So I'm not abstaining even though I wasn't here. <laughs> okay. You, you don't have to. It's a matter of conscience. So Amy I, was I <laughs> Next item is to warn a public hearing for the fiscal year. 2020 UPWP and budget. So I will uh, talk to this uh, briefly. Uh, so you have a memo in your packet that gives you a little, little background on the, uh, the process and also uh, what the UPWP committee uh, and executive committee are recommending uh, be considered by the board. Um, you'll see we're looking at $1.772 million of new funding um, for those of you on the UPWP committee, that's significantly higher than the no amount we normally talk about because it includes the GMT funding. So it's kind of a whole uh, additional uh, chunk of funds there. Um, and then on the second page of the memo, you'll see kind of a summary of the overall program. So that includes all the staff time and non-transportation funded programs, uh, grant agreements that we already have in place, uh, a little bit over $5.4 million. Um, you see the UPWP and executive committee have recommended that you warrant a public hearing for the draft UPWP and budget for your Mar or May 15th meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, that is the action requested in front of you. Following the memo is a table that uh, gives you the detail on the new projects um, following that 1.77 and I think you had in your uh, probably is a separate attachment sent to you, <coughs> full UPWP and budget. So happy to take any questions on those or comments. But thank you to the UPWP committee for all your work over the last two, three months. Are there any questions? Move to more and then have a hearing. Second. Second. Oh. So we'll go Andy with a second, Barbara with the motion to warn the public hearing. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Next up, Chris Dubin will present on our road erosion inventory. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, again, my name is Chris Dubin. I'm a transportation planner here, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Um, and today I'll be giving a brief update on uh, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission's uh, role in assisting municipalities in meeting uh, the goals of the Municipal Roads General Permit and the subsequent road erosion inventory that's needed to complete this. Um, through the Phase 1 uh, Lake Champlain TMDL, it was identified that, sorry for the poor choice of colors, but uh, developed lands, including paved roads and unpaved roads, <laughs> total to about 20% of the total. Um, and that's really where uh, 
through Act 64, additionally, uh, the municipal road, the impetus for the municipal road general permit uh, came from. Um, the uh, permit was issued in 2018, and it's looking to set deadlines for bringing all hydrologically connected roadway segments up to compliance. Uh, we're going to get into what that definition actually means shortly. But uh, from an operational perspective, the, uh, the way this, this permit will work is to inventory uh, segments of roadway, um, sort of figure out what's, what's happening with them, what erosion issues and standards out of what compliance issues they may have, prioritize those needs and implement solutions on those roads. Uh, to some extent, yes, we have used uh, water quality planning funds to further plan for what upgrades would need to be done if it's a more detailed level of work. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, implementation is going to come from uh, either capital funds at a town level or grant programs and other funding sources. So we're like, over, we're the umbrella, and the reason that we're doing this is because it's a way we integrate with our constituent municipalities? Yep, we're assisting them effectively in them reaching the goals of this permit. Uh, there's uh, a lot of <laughs> inventory work that we've been doing, um, and we want to take the next steps and, and help them kind of sift through and prioritize that data. Um, but we'll get into some of the solutions that oh, we've built. Okay. In, is, in a uh, and the other thing that I'm curious about, just because of me, is um, is this more important to the non-core communities, like out in the rural areas, or is this more important to the core communities or no difference between the two? Every town is under the permit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the variety of issues that they have may be a little bit of different, but they're all subject to the requirements mm -hmm. and the I was thinking about it more along the lines of how we're serving mm -hmm. our member communities. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because I know the core communities have fairly sophisticated public work staffs. And are, is this an instance where we are providing more technical assistance to the rural communities versus the core, or is everybody in the same boat? Even Stephen. Okay. Although I will say, from Bolton's standpoint, we've been very appreciative of the help we've gotten from the RPC because we don't have the staff, mm -hmm. as you said. So. I think it's also probably important as you look at this. If you look at our budget on a couple of pages prior, mm -hmm. we're almost a million dollars in water quality now. Uh, and I don't know the numbers offhand, but I know at least within the UPWP itself and total budget, I would bet three years ago it was a fraction of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we as a so this the is body the body have been moving, and I expect that to go up. As yeah. This is an extension of the stormwater quality yeah. issue and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so yeah. we just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, uh, getting back to this concept of, of hydrologic connectivity, it's a, a term or definition that was coined by uh, DEC, the, the people that sort of created this permit. Um, they basically said that uh, waterways of the state are a determining factor, the distance to waterways of the state are a determining factor, and uh, set a threshold of 100 feet uh, distance to a waterway of the state would, or, or less than that, would be a hydrologically connected roadway. Um, in addition, outlets uh, from catch basins on curved roadways are also covered under this permit and their proximity distance threshold, if you will, are set at a bit larger of a distance of 500 feet. Um, to kind of help towns and, um, well, to help municipalities address this issue in terms of inventorying this work, they, through uh, a GIS ex exercise, basically split all of the roadways into 100 meter segments. So we'll get a little bit into more of the standards and the inventory itself, but all of these segments are effectively about 100 meters in length. So you said the 100 meters, 100 foot proximity mm -hmm. to the roadway, mm -hmm. and that's 100 feet on a linear plane or vertically because there are a lot of lo roadways traveling the state as much as I have that are sheer, you know, so it could be 200 feet, you know, before you get down there, but right. on a plane, it's only 50 feet, right. you know. This was strictly a two-dimensional exercise, so it's, it's yep, it was flat plane analysis that, that again, the, the yep, yep. It's a good point. Um, <laughs> but if you think about it, if you're 200 feet higher than the water, but 50 feet away, 
probably anything going off that road is, is ending up in that stream. And, and the state recognized that this was by no means a perfect exercise. Um, and uh, municipalities have uh, the power to kind of say which segments may not actually be hydrologically connected or you know, add or delete as, as they feel necessary. Who decided uh, to mix English and metric measurements with this? Yeah. I was wondering that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say not us. Yes, not us. <laughs> but, uh, right. And about half of the roads generally uh, across the state uh, were determined to be uh, connected. Right. So just so you get a sense, it's not, not all the roads, mm -hmm. about half. Really? That might more. More? I thought it would be more. Than yeah, that. it's about half, yeah. And it's approximately, it's a little less, but still pretty close to 50% in Chittenden County as well. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at two different timelines, sort of the near-term timeline of the municipal roads permit and the longer term, the full timeline. These two slides were, were stolen from DEC's presentation. So uh, one key point is, is the issuance of the municipal roads general permit, which happened in 2018. Uh, we backtracked from that a little bit with the draft permit in which the RPC and many other state agencies were involved in providing comments for, et cetera. Um, we are obviously just past this date right here, the annual MRGP <coughs> compliance updates. That was a one-page form with which, in which your municipalities hopefully just filled out. And it basically asked, um, did you complete your inventory yet? If so, who did it? Um, if not, when do you intend to do it? Um, in future years, we will be asked or required to report on the actual data that we collected, but um, we're not necessarily there yet. Looking forward, okay. yep, we sure. Just I'm curious, where you, we've got a minimum of 15% of non-compliant segments upgraded to meet the standards. This is gonna take multiple years, and as you knock stuff off, 15% becomes more and more roadway. Right. So is that, is that how it's intended to be, or is that just kind of a language malfunction? It, well, in the, correct me if I'm it's, wrong, it's but from it's from the initial right. set. Oh, so even though you've... So you keep right. chopping it down. All right, right. so you, know, you, you cured some, if you will. That counts as... Yep. Okay. Right. right. And we'll get into a graph that... that cumulative. Yes. Uh, oh, that's the word. Right. We have a, a graph that may help sort of get at that in, in a little bit. Um, a couple intermediate deadlines uh, in the longer term. Well, I guess I'll start with the very end. By December 31st, 2036, this 20-year timeline, all roadways that are not in compliance or not meeting MRGP standards will need to be brought up to standards. Um, some other deadlines are looking at very high priority roads. Um, that's a definition of roadways that do not meet standards, they're non-compliant, and they're over 10% in slope. Uh, DC has recognized them as uh, very uh, high priority, if you will. Um, and there are intermediate deadlines for, for those as well. In addition, we have uh, a separate intermediate uh, deadline for class four roads as well. Some of the standards that uh, are sort of embedded in the inventory process um, are crowning of the roadway, uh, ditch, dimensions and type. Um, we can have stone line ditching, uh, grass line ditches with check dams, grass ditches, and those are dependent on things like slope of the road. Uh, outlet stabilization is another uh, standard within this permit uh, for curbed roadways, obviously. And uh, another one is uh, turnouts or uh, locations in which water is directed off of the road. And uh, the requirement is to make sure that those areas are stabilized and filtered with things like rock swales and vegetation. Uh, as we've talked about briefly, there's different types of roadways in, as defined in this permit, things like class four roads and curb and catch basin roads. Some of these specific standards within the permit don't necessarily apply to all roadway types. So there's some differences there. For example, on a paved roadway, when we will go out and inventory these roads, we're not actually evaluating whether or not there's a crown on the roadway, at least relative to this specific permit. And in class four roadways, for example, we're really not inventorying much at all. We're simply looking if there is severe or gully erosion, which in this permit is defined as erosion of uh, one foot in depth or greater. This is a, a screenshot of the road erosion inventory form that DEC has created. 
Um, as you can see, again, uh, not applicable for paved. Um, this is, again, how they help people, whether it be uh, municipal staff, RPC uh, folk, anyone who may be doing this inventory, uh, work through these questions. What we did is uh, converted this form effectively into a GIS database. Uh, we use that for collection, data collection, data management, um, quality control, mapping, analysis, and reporting. We just have sort of one uh, centralized database that can kind of do all that instead of relying on, on paper forms. So starting in the summer of 2016, we began using our team of interns to actually go out and do these inventories. Uh, over two summers, we've completed all Chittenden County municipalities that needed to apply for this permit. Um, and uh, with that, we decided to take this data and roll it up into uh, what is called a dashboard, but it's a web-based uh, application that allows anyone really um, to go to that URL and begin to explore the results of this road erosion inventory. We're going to come back to this at the end and it's uh, kind of go through a, a tutorial of, of what the tool is uh, intended to, to be used for. As I briefly spoke about earlier, outlets are a, a large uh, part of this permit, especially in Chittenden County. About 30% of the roadways that are uh, covered under this permit are curbed uh, that ultimately drain to an outlet. This is a, an area in the new north end of Burlington, and what we see here is a series of points, colored points that represent outlet locations and the colored line segments that um, have now been correctly mapped um, and sort of fixed in our database to be sort of uh, connected to that specific outlet. Um, this is really critical for uh, everything from prioritization of projects to reporting, um, because as you can see, uh, for example, in this pink uh, group of segments and respective outlet, some outlets may serve a large, much larger uh, impervious surface area than others. But some of those that are small are incredibly steep. So there's, there's a tremendous volume of water that right. are coming off of them. So right. And, and those very well, uh, for example, in this, this situation with our pink outlet, that one could be perfectly fine and not so, show any signs of erosion. So we're still going out to inspect and inventory these outlets themselves, but we really need to know how many segments are, are draining to them. Uh, this is a manual GIS project. I've been working with many uh, MS4 communities already. Uh, these totals are uh, segment totals uh, for curbed roadways and overall segment totals in your town. The difference would be things like gravel roads, paved roads without curbs. Um, but what you can see here is uh, the additions and subtractions to incorrectly identified hydrologically connected segments. So, for example, in Burlington, we needed to add 138 segments that initially DEC did not tell us were connected, and we needed to remove 147. So the net change was not very much, but we, we severely changed the actual segments that, that are part of this uh, database for, for Burlington. And conversely, in a town like Essex, we, we do, in fact, see quite a drop in the number of segments that are, are truly eligible under or covered under this permit. <laughs> but I assume, and I've assumed this, but I hate to assume, I'd rather ask the question, that none of this information involves the state roadway system. This is just the local roadway. That's system. correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, this is the municipal roads general permit. So they filtered out all state routes before they gave us the original data set. Yep. Then we're also excluding IBM, uh, any... Any large, I mean, it has nothing in, to do with private property. Private yeah. roads, yeah, 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 no. you know, some yeah. there's more yeah. so private private roads. roads yeah. yeah, and it doesn't mean that they aren't required to do stuff. Right. So they're under separate permits. Mm -hmm. So right, the, when the state was addressing the TMDL, the municipal roads general permit was the thing for municipal roads. There's a TS4, T, TS3, TS4 S4. <laughs> permit for the state highways. And then there's uh, just stormwater and three acre permits for private property owners. Um, and then of course, and then we also have the MS4 permits in our urban towns. So there's a lot of other permits going on besides this one. This is just the town road permit. So 
Well, all your condo associations and stuff that have private roads are not built into this. Yeah. Right, they're probably under that three acre permit. Okay. Thank you. And just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, what, what that's saying is that there's 783 1,000 meter. 100 meter. Uh, I mean, yes, I mean, 100 meter yep. sections. Of curb roadways in Burlington. That was what the state gave us initially. Right. Um, we ended up with um, 774 yeah. once we went through this exercise. We pretty much had to evaluate every single one of them wow. from scratch. It was a lengthy process. Uh, John, getting back to your earlier point of uh, this 15% rule as it changes, uh, looking into uh, how Chittenden County municipalities have been implementing projects and tracking that work, um, for the 10,000 plus segments across all of Chittenden County, um, about 1,747, 1,747 of them are non-compliant. That number of 262 is 15% of that total. So that, this, is the, this is part of this near-term compliance targets that we're talking about. And we'll get into a, li a little bit later, as I'll explain, we'll, you know, our, our team internally will constantly be going out and meeting with municipalities to update the inventory. But we have achieved upgrades of 147 segments over the last year. Um, of those, 42 have been in the hot, very high priority category. So that 138 is the total of all very high priority segments that need to be upgraded by the dates shown here. Is that pretty much our split about 50% of the two graphs, the one is a subset of the other? Is that that's pretty much our? Uh, that just, that's just how it happened, right? So you're asking, like, of all the things that we need to upgrade, how many fall into the very high priority yeah. category? Well, the 262 is actually only 15% of that entire total, whereas the 138 is all of them. Should have reiterated oh, that. Oh, all right. right. So I assume by looking at this that the 138 was a subset of the 262. That's not the case. No, it's not the case. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, basically, in the first couple of years, we got more than 50% towards that 15%. Yeah. Well, sorry, I shouldn't do that, but 50% of the 15%. Um, and you know we're a quarter of the way to meeting the uh, very high priority segment improvements. I say we, the municipalities are doing this work, right? Yeah. Careful with this graph as you go around with it because that's that's certainly not clear. I knew th I knew the 262 was only 15 percent of the total, right. but then in looking at the same graph, I would assume 138 is also 15 percent right. of the total, and that's clearly not what it states. Right. So just that's a little. Not, it's not intuitive. We, we struggled a lot with the presentation of this data, and, and we, Chris you know. is trying to see how few words you could have on <laughs> here, so. <laughs> the more words, the better, yeah. I think. What? The, the more, more words, the better. Words Noted. Laughing. More <laughs> words. So we Got need, it. We'll read them without. Thank you all. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, these two sort of lines and, and trajectories are really meant to be looked at independently from one another, I guess I'd say. Uh, so getting into implementation, um, we have been over the last year working through various grant programs, both uh, through VTRANS and DEC, to uh, get money to towns to implement projects. Uh, this was a, a, one of the earliest projects we did in, in Westford on Woods Hollow Road, um, and the before and after uh, clearly shows a substantial change to the roadway. Uh, this roadway, uh, based on the standards in the MRGP, should require a rock line ditch. Um, because of its slope, is it's greater than some threshold, and uh, we got grant money to re-establish this ditch and rock line it. There were some other aspects of this project, like recrowning the roadway, removing the greater berm, and adding some cross culverts in uh, as well. I'm curious, looking at the photo there, did you got any feedback from like neighbors and stuff that you uglified their road and they're, uh, they're teed off or is this, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think everybody would agree with what you're doing here, don't get me wrong, but I'm just curious what the public feedback when their daily commute changes. Right, uh, the only thing we've heard about was, was Bolton, um, just because uh, we've been working with a lot, them with a, them a lot lately and, um, but I, I don't know, I, I don't, sometimes it doesn't make it, uh, make it back to me personally. But I, I don't know if anyone else has heard anything from their town specifically. Well, I mean, just even when we do ordinary, we haven't, you know, 
uh, just regular road work when you have to clean out a ditch or something or take down a tree. You really hear it. I mean, people do jump all over the, the road crew and the select board for doing that. People don't want their, they like that, that canopy road look, you know, even right. though it's not really the best thing in the world. <laughs> uh, this is an example of uh, uh, an outlet location in the new slash old north end of Burlington draining down to the, the wetlands by 127. Uh, the pipe basically disconnected to, uh, from itself and, and eroded away a pretty substantial area well, of more than volume. A yeah, it's, it's, that would be deemed very high priority. <laughs> Um, and this last location is, is a conveyance area um, in which down in this ravine, there's, there's a stream right there. So reestablishing this rock swale uh, was pretty critical um, for this area. So all these projects we, we got grant money for and, and assisted municipalities in um, cutting down their costs effectively. Uh, so this is a summary of, of really what, what money grant, grant money is coming into Chittenden County specifically. Um, as you can see, certain grant programs didn't exist in certain years, um, and you know it, they they do vary across across programs. Um, these last two specifically are ones that I've been working with a lot more, um, and they really try to harp on this concept of you know eligibility is defined as non-compliant roadways that are hydrologically connected and through this process, the roadway will be upgraded to meet MRGP standards. So uh, we're gonna give a real quick tutorial here um, on this tool, but ultimately our goal is to continue to update our database as towns are making progress for this and continue to assist municipalities in any sort of grant and administrative work. So this is the actual tool. Uh, along the bottom here, uh, I apologize for the lack of labels, um, but uh, these are the individual town segment totals. Uh, in this pie chart, we have the actual overall segment compliance countywide and the surface type countywide, as well as a mileage tracker. Uh, the, the nice thing about this tool is that you can begin to filter data and these graphs and charts will update dynamically. So if we were to zoom in and take a look at what's happening in Westford, um, which is probably more similar to the rest of Vermont than some other towns, um, we can begin to look at what, what is their homework assignment, right? So if we look at only their non-compliant roadways, we're looking at a 173 segments, which total to about a little less than 15 miles, and eight of those specific segments are deemed very high priority. Um, this database uh, is spatially accurate um, but also contains the actual discrete data that we collected in the field. Uh, it looks like this was inventoried on July 24th, and these are the individual assessment of uh, standards within um, this individual segment. What we'll also do is make sure that we're uh, updating this with changes. So if we actually look right around here, um, we will reassess this, work done. This was that grants and aid, this grant project that I showed you the pictures of before and after. Um, and now this segment is green, it fully meets. So this is sort of the live current status of, of roadways as it pertains to the municipal roads permit. So we encourage you to, to use this tool, play around with it, um, comments, give me comments and you know questions if you have them. And is there a, a, a readily identifiable link yep. from the RPC's main page to get there? Um, I think there is, if not, we can make sure that we publicize that. Um, we have that, I think, in here somewhere, but um, we'll get that up if, if it's not readily available. So you really need to train those interns, huh? Yeah, they, they pick it up pretty quick. They're, they're pretty smart, so. It's only as good as their observation. <clears throat> it's actually pretty good work for an intern to do. It is. I mean, substantial, and you, know, you can walk away from that at the end of the summer on every Well, I'm talking about, you know, partially meets, fully meets, the type of crown. Mm. That's quite a bit of training that goes in. Do training them all together so they're using the same. Well, we start, we start with this, right? And within probably less than two weeks, they have all of these standards uh, memorized. So, Jeff, that's a good point. You say partially meets. Well, that's a very clear definition. 
of, for example, roadway crown must be between 50 and 89% of the roadway is crowned properly. And they'll have a supplemental documentation workbook that says exactly what that crown and tape is. measures and yeah, strings yeah, and all that kind they're, of stuff. They're yeah. using tools on their phone to measure slope, you know. Any other questions? Well, this isn't a question, but I think one of the things that's coming up is the availability of enough stone to uh, do all this. And, you know, 10 years down the road, all of these ditches are going to need to be cleaned out. So how are we going to harvest the stone? How are we going to reclaim that stone? What are the tools that we're going to need? Um, and I mean, there's a shortage of that stone at this point. I think that the, the MRGP team at, at DEC has been sort of punting on the maintenance issue, at yeah. least now, and their focus is how do we get all, we're, Chittenden County is so far ahead of the game in terms of getting the inventory done, the initial sort of look, look in on, on the status of our roads, so they're, they're still at the first step in this process. It has the feel of replacing 1928 bridges. <clears throat> yeah, the way I heard about the stone thing was from a, a neighboring RPC who was hearing from their towns that Chittenden County was taking all the yeah. stone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. First come, first serve. Just another reason, well, we Just another reason to have Chittenden a... County envy. Uh, no, yeah, was, uh, <laughs> anything else? All right, thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. The state would be so much better off if we just send them our money and not take care of ourselves. Next item, charge to Board Development Committee to develop slate of officers for fiscal year 20. It says chair action. I charge the Development Committee with coming up with a slate <laughs> right. of candidates. And the <laughs> Development <laughs> Committee is myself, <laughs> Jeff, and Catherine. Yes. Yep. And, I, and I understand this is the last year we can torture you, Mr. Chair. That's right. Um, so if anybody's interested in serving on the executive committee, being in any of the, uh, of the officer roles, let us know. Let Charlie know. Let me know. Um, and we'll be meeting. The, our committee will be meeting. Yeah, everybody um, needs to understand that um, we try to balance the executive committee membership with certain members from smaller communities and then certain members from the core communities. And then we have rules about how long people can serve in uh, the positions. And we have a past chair position so that when we boot the chair of the commission, that person becomes automatic past chair, and then Montreal will go out and drink uh, adult beverages <laughs> for a while. <laughs> because he's been chat past chair for a long time yes. and head of this committee. Yes. Long enough for three years. Yeah. And, um, and the, the way this is structured in the bylaws is that uh, the Board Development Committee has to report back to the full board by the um, May meeting, right? By the May, May meeting, meeting, so that you have the slate of officers a month in advance of the annual meeting in June. So that's where we vote. Uh, it's a little formal uh, process uh, piece here. So, yeah. all right. Well, you're so, so charged, charged. <laughs> and uh, all right. the chair has acted. Um, next item: Winooski master plan approval, confirmation of planning process, and determination of energy compliance. Emily, you will speak to this. Emily. Sure, I will. Um, and I'll actually speak to both the Winooski and the Colchester plan um, at the same time during my review, because what I have to say is uh, substantially similar sure. about both of them. Both of them are new plans, readoptions that are um, include new content and will give eight years before expiration in both cases. Mm -hmm. um, they're both great plans, and we're going to read. And we reviewed them at the staff level. Um, in both cases throughout the process of a nice iterative process in both cases um, Regina in our office actually did the writing for the Winooski plan and we have had them before the PAC a few times um, the PAC and staff have reviewed them found that they are meeting the statutory requirements for planning uh, they're compatible both with the plans of the surrounding municipalities and with our regional plan and they are meeting the requirements for energy planning uh, that the state of Vermont has put out. That's an optional process, but uh, both of them have chosen to, to pursue it, and so that'll give their plans substantial deference before the Public Utilities Commission. <coughs> um, there's much more detail included in your packet if you're interested in the process or comments for either one of them. 
but in both cases, uh, both the planning advisory committee and staff are recommending that the plans be approved, the confirmation, the planning process be confirmed, and that they have an affirmative determination of energy compliance. Are there any questions with respect to either the Winooski or Colchester town plan and the process that led to them? If not, there's a recommended motion with respect to each of them. We can do them, I guess, combined or separately, but if someone wants to do it combined, I'm not going to be adverse to that. I move we approve them both as presented in the uh, package. Second. Dan is the second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Do we, do we need to confirm their planning process in a separate thing, or is the approval it's of the plan the, confirmed? It's, it's all part of that same motion. Part. Okay, just, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yep. Next item, S96 recommendations. Okay, um, so in your packet, there's a memo giving you a little bit of background uh, about this bill. S96, it passed out of the Senate uh, a couple weeks ago. It is in front of the House Committee on Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife currently. Um, they really just started uh, taking up uh, testimony uh, last week and uh, asked me to testify last Thursday uh, in advance of your meeting, for which I apologize, but um, thought we'd try to introduce some ideas to them early on, so I did testify. Um, and there, I guess I'll give you a little bit of update about uh, where I think the status of the bill is and what's kind of happening with this um, big picture. So this is, um, this bill is really about two different things. One, it, I believe, is intended to be the bill for additional water quality revenue this year. So there's kind of one provision that's in there for that. And it's proposing uh, to shift some of how water quality funds are distributed across the state uh, by going to this clean water service provider model, which is more of a watershed based. There'd be a clean water service provider for every watershed. So it's more of a regionalized approach rather than right now everything goes through the DEC office. Um, and I think the DEC office, well, I won't get into that too much, but um, a and R is the one who kind of proposed that, uh, partly in part to address challenges within uh, that they have in terms of getting out hundreds of grants a year. Um, so they're proposing that. Um, any questions, kind of about the status? Um, Jeff. So it only went through the Senate Program Authorizing Committee. It did not go through the Senate Finance Committee because it doesn't have a revenue component to it. It went through all those committees, but the Senate Finance did not add any language to it. So they kind of passed it on, um, and then it got voted on by the, the full Senate. My understanding is that there was some understanding between the Senate and House that the Senate was drafting this delivery system, this regional delivery system, and that the House would work more on the specific of the revenue. Because isn't it usually true that it goes through a program authorizing committee? They authorize the program, and then it goes through the money committee yep. in that chamber, and then they say they modify the program to conform to the amount of money they want to earmark towards it. And it seems like in the Senate, we bypass that. No, it went through those committees. But the, the, and the Senate Finance Committee didn't attach any revenue sources to it. That's correct. It did, it, it did nothing to modify the program authorizing committee, which then it seems like it's going to go to the House. It is at the House. It's at the House, author House Authorizing, Program Authorizing Committee. It will then go to House Ways and Means for yes. the revenue side. Yes. They will pass a bill, and then they will go to conference without having had the Senate Finance Committee weigh in on the revenue things. Is that what I'm understanding? That sounds essentially like the process. And my understanding is that there was some, some sort of agreement or understanding between the Senate and House where the Senate was OK deferring to House Ways and Means to develop the revenue. And so piece. the next question is, how much revenue is this going to involve? Yeah, so um, uh, thanks for bringing that up. If you, if you uh, were, had a lot of time and you actually read this bill, 
which I don't expect any of you to have done. Uh, but there is the money provision is basically one, maybe one or two sentences in there that says the legislature's committing to uh, have 50 to 60 million dollars annually for water quality. That is pretty much what has been happening. Um, and the way I've heard this explained is that coming into FY20, which is the budget we're talking about, um, the uh, legislature and the administration both understood that the state was going to back off of the amount of capital funding. So they've been taking some of the bonding authority uh, revenue of the state and the, these last two years have significantly increased the amount of capital funding going to water quality projects. In FY20, and I think a mutual agreement, they were stepping that back. And the number I've heard is by about $8 million. And so the gap in funding that I think House Ways and Means is trying to plug is around $8 million. And this is only going to happen in six weeks. That is the sense I'm getting that they're trying without, to without get to. A, without an early marker from the Senate on where the money is going to come from or anything because they rejected the governor's proposal. Yeah. The, yeah. So, sorry, for those of you who maybe not be following, the governor proposed uh, filling that gap with the estate tax. Part of the estate tax. It, or part of the estate tax um, and yeah that does seem that that was I don't know how formally but or informally but not has not been taken up and not going to happen and so it is now in uh, or should be shortly getting to house ways and means to figure out how to fill that financial gap no questions yet this is unusual this is not I'm just trying to get my operating yeah. procedure well in my, in my my cynical Jeff uh, way of looking at this is we wrapped ourselves around the axle on Act 250 reform and now it's not going anymore. So I'm just trying to get a reading on if we wrap ourselves around the axle weighing in on this kind of stuff again are we doing this with the idea that it's going to sit there for six, eight more months before it gets serious again or is this do we really have to do this and use your valuable time and divert our energy uh, to something like this uh, to either do a positive thing or if I'm seeing the way that the, there's a proposal to potentially have the RPC on the hook for enforcement um, I just I want to make sure that as a commissioner of this organization that I understand what's going on and I and I and we're not pursuing a fool's errand that this is real and this is a real risk and it's worth your valuable time to be participating in this because we think this is really going to happen. I will give it a 85 to 90 percent chance that this bill is moving forward. I think the but maybe some things that we're concerned about may not be there in yes. this time this year, and there's a role for us to play in that to protect us from becoming an enforcement stooge um, mm. for things. I mean, basically have no ability to affect the policy, but all the liability for seeing it, it's done. That's the concern. Probably the primary, primary topic I want to right? discuss. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I said, yeah, basically. Following just for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree. I agree. Senate I just wanted to work it out. I courageously <laughs> passed a bill that shifts liability to the regions well, regional without providing questions. funding. That's what the Senate did. They, they <laughs> Mike drop. <laughs> Nicely played. Well played. Mr. South Burlington is out. With the <laughs> we already have our stormwater utility. We don't need to do that. I just wanted to make sure that I understood the totality of what this was. Yeah. I, I think that's pretty much the whole context going on. I mean, yeah. Obviously, none of us know what they will actually end up doing. Uh, it does feel like there is, uh, you know, pressure to get this through this, the Natural Resources Committee shortly, um, and by that I mean this week or next week. Um, so to me, this, the timing of our meeting tonight is fortuitous because I think I have at least one significant question to kind of put on the table and, and ask for feedback that would be, I think, helpful to the deliberations of that committee before they vote it out. And just my last clarifying question. Um, the revenue source, if it is not a capital item, that could become an item in the big bill, the budget for this year, which could then become something that gets 
involved in end of the session stuff mm -hmm. like we've seen the last two or three absolutely okay. yeah yeah, I mean, my this is a fun one. My little p political sense is that, is that both, all, all, well, the leadership of the two chambers have committed to getting something done on water quality. Um, yeah, we've yeah. we've we've made that commitment for multiple years, yeah. well, but we haven't been able to arrive at a consensus this time for real. No. Charlie, is VAPT and the other RPCs are they all on the same page, or are you working on this on your own right now? Um, yeah, so uh, I had the fun of uh, also being the chair of the Natural Resources Committee for the RPC statewide. So, um, so for good and bad, um, that, that means, to Jeff's point about my time, that doesn't mean I spend more time uh, herding cats um, <laughs> and seeing to what extent. And I think um, a, a lot of these uh, major points we have come to agreement on, oh, you know, that, that you know, we, you know, we always try to be a good partner with the state um, and can help where we can help, um, but we also don't want this to feel like a permit. Um, and getting back to this enforcement question, which I, is really, to me, the big sticking point uh, about how this is structured right now. Okay. Any other background questions? Well, just to be clear, I. This is about all the money for the voluntary uh, oh, thanks. projects that are in the tactical basin plans or someplace. So this is not a, a, about regula meeting regulatory things, and the majority of what we have to do is on private <laughs> land, and it means that you have to get landowners to agree to do these projects. And so it's, it, yeah. it's a tall task, it's a lot of money that's needed and um yeah actually let me give a little more context yeah. thanks for bringing yeah. that up um so this this uh restructuring i, I think was also uh, uh the secretary more realizing that particularly in the north and south ends of lake champlain where and lake champlain basin which we all know well is where they've done most of the modeling um but um when they looked at what was going to get accomplished via p permits, so everything regulatory, the things we just mentioned in the, <laughs> Chris's presentation, um, Julie had the, the, her first two years, sorry, Secretary Moore had been testifying that probably 90% of meeting our water quality goals was going to get accomplished just by people meeting the permit requirements. I think as she's dug into that a little bit more, she's realized there are at least parts of the Lake Champlain watershed where um, the compliant, like it's not really possible to get there uh, just through permit uh, requirement. And really those are the areas, um, frankly, outside of Chittenden County, the areas further north and south to us where um, there were very high assumptions about how much farmers were gonna be able to do, um, like in, like that they were gonna be able to reduce 80 something percent of their pollution, where they're 40% of the problem. And so there was kind of an unrealistic demand expectation about what was going to get accomplished through the permit. So this, I believe, is a shift in strategy to say, we need more to happen in terms of voluntary projects. We need more work to happen more locally with property owners, uh, watershed groups, conservation districts to get voluntary projects done. Um, but so this whole structure, this regional structure, is to focus on these voluntary projects, not municipal roads, not stormwater improvements or anything. So uh, thanks for that part of the context. Um, and we lost the lottery last week, right? Lost the well, the clean energy project through Lake Champlain isn't going to happen because Central Maine Power won the distribution thing over in Maine. Maine got the transmission corridor of the Canadian power to the Boston market. Um, the clean energy link through Lake Champlain was one that didn't stand a great probability of success. Um, and, you know, there was another one through Granite State, which everybody knows about a year and a half ago failed. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one that Velco was pr uh, talking about going through the Northeast Kingdom and then down into New Hampshire that Vermont would have got a little piece of. But the TDI project had what? 
50, 60 million dollars a year for clean and water as part it was like of it. Five million over oh, 20 or 30, 30 years. Five million per year yeah, over yeah. 20 or 30 years, along with all sorts of other green mail to get it approved. Yeah, right. But it didn't stand the chance uh, against some of the other transmission corridors that I think all central main power had to do was enhance one that already existed to get the power over. So that decision was only made last week. So now the TDI clean energy thing is off the table. Done. Isn't it under appeal? I thought uh, some of the groups in Maine were. <laughs> well, there, everything's always under yeah, appeal. Yeah, okay. that's true. That's true. Um, so until it isn't. So but, um, they're, not gonna, they're not going to pay what they have to pay to go through bottom, the, the, the cable through Lake Champlain. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, we had a presentation on that about three years ago. The guy came, actually came in with a cross section of the cable. It's really quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> was it three years ago? Yeah. 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 So that's how all this ties together. That's yeah. why we're now, I think, finally getting serious about <laughs> the funding. Yeah, thing. right. Because well, there's true. no more lottery out there as a possibility for us. That would have been very helpful if it happened. Yeah. So if I can uh, turn your page to the attachment to the memo, which was just a two-pager, which is somewhat you know, basically written uh, as, as I testified last week. Um, and I'll, I'll give some credit um, to uh, A&R. Uh, their general counsel presented yesterday and uh, had addressed a lot of these. So, um, and there's really no, uh, no debate issues on, uh, in terms of the, the first page. I'm going to turn to the second page of this. Um, and maintenance responsibility was one big thing. Uh, they also made some changes uh, similar to the language uh, that came out of our, uh, our Clean Water Advisory Committee and from our Executive Committee a couple weeks ago. The, so they have some language similar to this now in the latest draft the A&R proposed back. <clears throat> um, the, the one big issue is in the middle of the page in F accountability for pollution reduction goals. Right now, you, or I'm sorry, previously that language uh, had, you see number two <coughs> st struck through there. Um, that strike through language basically said they could take enforcement action against a clean water service provider. Um, I'm gonna pass out. And just to explain to people, the default clean water service provider is? Well, it was the RPCs. Right. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> By the time it got uh, through the Senate, they took out the predisposition towards RPCs. Um, so it was kind of any, any organization, but mostly the conversation has been about RPCs, conservation districts, and maybe a watershed group might want to be a clean water service provider. Um, who would want the liability? Who, who would want the liability? Then there's, I was going to say, nobody wants the council. The, 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 you know, there's the ref, there's the, the provider which are going to disperse oh. it, but then there's the there's a basin makers, council. You know, council. I mean, it, to me, it's just adding a whole level of of government of kind of governance yes. that is duplicitous. Um, is there? Is there anybody? Duplicative, you mean. Is there Let's anybody on this commission that believes that we should accept the enforcement liability without having a say, without having uh, the oversight in what is done? I don't even know what I wanted, even if we had input on I know. Well, I'm just saying. I don't think saying, well, I don't think that a technical, I mean, it yeah. means that they're just shifting mm -hmm. our. It would be an extraordinary yeah. change to our mission and operations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's not what we do. Right. We don't do that kind I mean, of implementation. That, yeah. I mean, and even in our MPO business, start, we're not implementing at odds with our, <laughs> our municipalities, too. Municipalities. Right. Yeah, so um, I, I pass out this one page because at the bottom of page 12 here, you'll see um, that uh, A&R was proposing they struck the language that was there and put in some different language. I'm not sure how much better or not, but I, I just wanted, in fairness to them, <laughs> share with you the latest version. So it says, instead of an initiate enforcement action, it says, assess penalties established as a term of its grant agreement it, with the Clean Water Service prior, which shall increase. So, so I don't the even want to read the rest of the sentence after assess penalties. Which shall increase. Okay, I don't so even want to read the rest of the sentence. penalty instead of a <laughs> statutory penalty. If I'm penalized for a thousand bucks, you can call it Fred. I'm still paying a thousand bucks, so I don't care where it comes yeah. from. 
Yeah, so they changed the language a little bit, oh, but it still has penalties in there. So I'm just trying to be fair to them no. that they did. <laughs> they did update. Um, we and get to penalize the state when they don't do what they're supposed to. Yeah. Oh, we can't do that, can we? Um, just like we can penalize the feds. Um, so I would, I'd love to ask <laughs> for uh, as strong a vote as you want then on the feelings of the of the commission with regard to this provision, especially because. I'd like to get back in front of them and tell them that either uh, we could live with this or we can't live with this. Uh, I would I would move that is the sense of the commissioners on this board that the RPC is not in a position technically or financially to be assessed penalties of any kind for noncompliance by another party. There's second. Second. <laughs> Andy seconded. Any further discussion? Yep. Sorry, Amy. I, I would say that. Um, it's not just the financial burden of it. It's just the whole operation, operation, operation. of it. Yeah. So, I mean, if, I mean, dollars okay, are so going to talk. But you said I, technically I, or feasibly. I said technically. Okay. I said uh, technically is why I used okay. it. I did put technically in it. Okay. Um, and, and it's actually not consistent with our mission. It potentially puts us in office. So, yeah, just I can. I don't mind if the seconder of the motion would say and, and say and that is inconsistent with the RPC's stated mission. Is that okay with you? Yes, yeah, friendly. I think colloquial Charlie could use the term non-starter in his discussions. <laughs> <laughs> I've been using poison pill, but yeah, yeah. non-starter. That, that's the most diplomatic I've seen. I've seen Zaccone be in about ten years. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous vote noted. Thank you. Probably I'd not because like I'm abstaining. Oh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Amy abstained. I have to abstain. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Everyone who could vote voted affirmatively. It was an RPC vote. I could vote. Member yeah. no, you're not a member community. Though. You're not a member community. You don't agree. You're a transportation funder and an MPO. She's a member, a voting member of the committee. Depends on what you call this. But on MPO issues, right? But she's not going to be subject to the, to the, to the, uh, to the penalty. I mean, I didn't know that. Is that in our charter? It won't put us We're going to have to, we're have to, we're have to look at that. <laughs> the only thing I officially can't vote on is your town your plans. plans. Yeah. Town plans, yep. I just wanted to point out that I think that within A&R, there's, and, and even with the presentation from Chris, the amount of technology and data that's been coming in to help assess and do this type of work for clean water is just kind of increasing exponentially of what the staff at A&R is doing and their capacity and their reluctance to do this is that they, they made a quick assumption that they didn't really have the staff capacity to do all of this. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that they they really um, did a full assessment of how, how internally within A&R they could restructure things to more effectively um, address this, aside from where the money's coming from. Um, so I have uh, kind of confidence that if we push it back to A&R and say, look, keep doing what you've been doing and, and um, don't put the burden on, on, on our agencies and our agents. <coughs> Well, I think, isn't it more, don't ask us to do something that's outside of our capability? For uh, us, yeah, yes. Yeah, for us. Absolutely. And it's not, that, it's not that we wouldn't help in trying to find out a solution. It's just we don't feel in this environment and where our staff capacities are and where our mission is that this is something is in line with what it is that we could or, you know, much less should accept. So I don't, I, I mean. Yeah. So just before I got myself. Or now, I, myself now what I don't want to, but what I don't want to have happen is, is then, then have the legislature turn around and change the mission of ACCD yeah. and put it as part of our ACCD grant every year. Um, and that's yeah. the risk. Yeah. So just to, and, and push on me as, as, <laughs> as you need to, but I, I've been saying, you know, we'd be happy to try to help get money and, you know, for projects to towns or, or whoever. Conservation district, water because we do that. Because yeah. we do we that. We do that. Right, but yeah, was this kind of enforcement and you know unrealistic expectations about us taking on maintenance that were, we're issues? We're a municipal service organization, and right. then we're going to be enforcing against any any municipal 
grant that's done, much less the private sector. Well, I will say that Mike O'Brien was a bit attracted <laughs> to the concept that we might get badges and sidearms. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Be nice. That was true. Be nice to his incoming highness. <laughs> You're right to the badge. Actually, in fairness, I'm like, I think I may have brought that up. Like, this, will get, this will get easier when we get guns oh and badges. Oh, my God. I don't, under I don't understand why even a watershed district would want the responsibility being a clean water provider if they're, you know, penalized. And they right. Actually, right. actually, I well, prefer can't accept the responsibility to not want to. Yeah. Right. But the rub becomes somebody has to do it. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and who would, I mean, well, what? you could, you could make an arm of ANR, you could create a board at the state level um, where the cases get brought because yeah. you're going to need due process, you're going to need lawyers, you're going to, I mean, it's not just finding somebody right. that they're in compliant and and, and you slap them with a fine. There's the whole due process on how you fight that back if you don't believe you're going to be under you appeal be for years. That way. What's that? Yeah. It'd be so, under appeal so for years. Yeah. Yeah. There are mechanisms to do it, but they'd have to create it either within ANR or a state board or something. They, they can't. They, they, they can't they access could do. to beat the crap out of our constituent membership organization, yeah. our members of our own organization. We John, how serve about the them. We're going to enforce it. <laughs> What's that? Ask John about how about the T board. There's always discussions that can be had. <laughs> well, he is a power grabbing maniac, but I don't, know if, I don't know if he even wants this. But I'm just saying, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's just way more complicated. We don't. Not only is it our mission, we don't even have an arm of our mission that even gets into anything like it. Yeah. Uh, it would be a radical departure from what we do. Goodness. Thank anything? you very okay. much. So, so we need to find a workable solution uh, for this because. We have to do well, these projects. We just have to find the right way to do it and the right organizational and oversight slash enforcement resources that are needed to do the job. And there's an appropriate Even facilitative legislature. Not, not us. Not us. us. No, I'm, not sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying we, the Big RPC. We. I'm saying the He's state. state. Yes. Yeah. Just like we're in favor of renewable energy, right. okay, right. we are in favor of clean water. And le last time I checked, Okay, Still. so we are we are proposing to be constructive in this within the bounds of reason and asking us to be enforcers or even overseers of private entities that do that is utterly inconsistent with our staff resources and our mission. And then to add on to that and then the potential to be held liable if right. we're not successful in our enforcement activities. I, I understand that nobody wants to have this responsibility, but somebody has to have that responsibility. If this is the way we elect to do it in this way in the state, if we elect to farm it out and then have an enforcement function for people to do these things right, which if we're giving out money from the taxpayers, we ought to, even if it's bond money, okay, the taxpayers are still going to pay that back over 20 years with interest, okay? We owe it to ourselves to do this correctly, and we as an RPC should position ourselves to be in uh, a, a positive contributor, but not in a way which violates our capabilities or our mission. That maybe violates is the wrong one. It's inconsistent yeah. with yeah. our mission, capabilities, and resources. Agreed. All right. Thank you. Next item, executive director report. Oh, legislative update. So there's this bill, S-96. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other uh, you are a comedian, aren't you? <laughs> the other uh, thing that is not happening, as Jeff re referenced earlier, is uh, the Act 250 bill. <coughs> you know, since we, I think I probably gave you a little bit of an update last month. Uh, it seems get, it getting clearer by the day that um, probably the House Natural Resources Committee is probably going to hold that bill through the summer. It's um, not even a bill yet. Well, it, yeah. Presumably, it comes a, a, comes a draft becomes bill. A, a bill at some point, uh, but the draft bill, um, they are still making, talking about changes to that draft bill, um, and so they're going to hold on to it. Um, so on the good news front, that will probably leave some time for people to work on some specific provisions. Um, in particular, I think of uh, importance to us is figuring out how the enhanced designation existing settlements, whatever it is, whatever, however that works to promote smart growth development in our region is going to be a real uh, important provision. So I will leave it at that and just, you know, that's the heads up. Um, there's a lot of other things going on in the legislature, but those are the two big things I've been tracking. 
Um, I don't know if there are any questions, comments on that. Good. No. Thanks. Anything else to report? No, not at this time. But thank you, Amy, for taking minutes. <laughs> All right, next on the agenda, we have a variety of committee and liaison activities and reports. Are there any members' items or other business that you wish to raise at this time? Yes. Um, I happened to hear on the radio today about um, Vermont law, uh, perhaps being a state where um, driverless cars might be tested. Yes, I heard that too. Yeah, and um, VLCT weighed in that municipalities ought to, and, and I was kind of mulling over in my head. I'm not sure where that sits, but I wondered why we wouldn't, as the RPC MPO, want to at least talk about it, uh, uh, whether we would have an opinion on this or whether it's just gonna go ahead. Um, you know, I can think of pros and cons to it, uh, but it, it just seemed like it, that there, you Would you know, like someone to come and do a presentation to you? Um, sure. I, I, I think that'd be great. Because I I, you'll recall the last iteration of the ECOS plan, we did include language in there it. anticipating um, driverless vehicles, and the challenge from a planning perspective at the time, you know, is what? A year ago, but that's a that's an eon in, in 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 technological terms. There still wasn't enough data to really know how to deal with it in a planning way. Uh, but certainly, as part of the process to educate ourselves <clears throat> about what the implications are, positive and negative, that allows us to develop a base of knowledge that will then in turn inform our planning processes as we go forward. I think it's important. Because any, any testing of that is more likely than not going to be focused uh, in, in, in great part in Chittenden County. So I think we need to be ahead of the curve. Yes and no. I understand that part of the reason they want to do it here is that the technology is coming. The Vermont terrain actually has certain challenges. Mm -hmm. If you're not in on the grand scope of planning, you know, you're liable to have m more problems when it actually starts than you want because you didn't have, you know, your, your foot in the door. Uh, there's also a comfort level. Um, they've seen, um, at least their studies show that the closer people get to them, the more comfortable with the technology they are. So if it's being worked in your backyard and people then are, get more familiar with it, familiarity breeds some kind of acceptance. Uh, you get a lot of people now that will tell you, N no way, no how, never, and they actually do start to change their minds a bit once they're educated. And uh, I'd like to see how they're going to interact at a certain interchange in Colchester and Williston and how they perform in rotaries with pedestrians and bicycles. Roundabout. Love they, to see they, that. They can probably do that elsewhere. I think the, <laughs> the yeah. challenge... They can do that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the challenge may be the, the winter blizzards. conditions and, and actually are more rural areas. They're roads, too. Yeah. Yeah. They, that, they oh, that don't have lines? Yeah, <laughs> that don't have lines. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, well, they use rocks <laughs> that are aligned. Do you, do you want to take uh, Amy up on her I, offer I to have so. Joe Sigali come in and talk to us? Yeah. And the other thing I'm going to offer, and I will try to follow up... I'm going to come in with Michelle. If we include this in the minutes, um, is that I believe in our ECOS plan, when we did talk about this a year and a half, two years ago, I think we did have some language about encouraging testing it yeah. in uh, Vermont. So I think, it, and I, I got to double check that. So that's been in the back of my mind and part of why I didn't think we had a policy. I don't think the sentiment was very positive two years ago, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, I think we, we were like what we, was I think we had anxiety about it, but yeah. wanted to make sure it was tested before it's, you know, go, goes fully adopted, which and is have all its accidents before it gets here. Yeah. <laughs> well, because aside from how it works, the impact, would that mean there's actually yeah. more vehicles on the road than less? Oh, because they're only that far apart at 55 miles an hour? And, well, you know, it drops you off and then has to go some other yeah, place. Right. Deadheading. Oh, deadheading. Oh, yeah, right. drop you off at work and then so go back home. So we have twice as much travel. I, I think it would be important if we're going to bring Joe in, Joe's very knowledgeable on this, is to let him know what we want. I mean, he's got a whole presentation on how it all works, where it's going, what the future looks like it is, you know, as of today. And then that's kind of separate than the effort to get the testing yeah. right, here yeah. in Vermont. So if we're going to invite Joe in, which I think is a great idea, 
we need to give him some guidance on what it is that we actually want him to talk about because it's, it's a much bigger topic than he could ever fill time with that we'd be able to give him. So what is it that you want to actually hear? Why, why shouldn't we? You want to hear about the testing. Yeah, yeah. I, I was feeling like, we, you know, my first reaction was, why, of course we would want them to test it here. Why wouldn't we? But if you're against them, then, and it proves that they're really great, then you've lost your chance to say no. <laughs> That's yeah. the cynic. And there is a, there is a debate. Uh, you started off with the VLCT yeah. position. Yeah. There is a debate about uh, whether towns should have to opt in to being, yes. uh, allowing testing within their municipality, or should the uh, statutory language be that a town has to opt out of being a testing location. So that's, that's, a, that's a debate that's going on in the legislature. By the time of your next board meeting, that debate is probably going to be over. <laughs> but we'll at least know which way it landed. Wouldn't that be a but kick if it couldn't operate on class four like, roads? Um, that is a reasonable why, <laughs> why as an as a RPC that deals with transportation and our municipalities, that it would yeah. be, we would have been a, a good place to at least have that discussion as opposed to the LCT weighing in for all the towns when yeah. you know we're so much more intimately connected with transportation in Chittenden County. Um, Same thing with commuter rail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> yes. So on along those lines, if you, and I'm unclear on this as a transportation body primarily, but with the uh, two items that occurred to me in the last week or so, where fossil fuel infrastructure, I think, is getting debated at the state house. We don't have to weigh in on that, do we? Very first one. And in today's seven days, there was a nice big article, not article, ad from an organization in Putney that's against 5G because of radiation concerns. Mm -hmm. Are those things that we would get involved in as well when you talk about conversion? So, you know, more of the utility type, probably under the public utilities more than our bailiwick, but I'd like to know, we just, we, we aren't as anchored in it as with transportation, I think is what I'm asking. And, you know, should we inform ourselves, will we ever have an opportunity to weigh in on either of those two topics? And I don't know enough about 5G to know one way or the other if it's a, a noise or, or what. Yeah, I mean, our plan has broad it policy statements too. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I actually know a little bit about that, and it has to do with weather forecasting. Because Ooh. whenever you see Doppler radar, that um, that's very close to that frequency of 5G, and they're concerned that this could cause as much as 18% inaccuracies in weather forecasts, which, yeah, who cares with a big rain shower? But when you're talking about Hurricane Sandy, it could be a big difference. Our, our, our ECOS plan has br some broad policies related to those two topics. You know, I don't... We haven't drilled down is what we're hearing, but we'll yeah. be updating the ECOS plan and we have the opportunity to drill down. If the president says we're up. going to 10 G, so. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, the EPA might not make us be forced to well, 10 G also why we worry about Don't have that stuff in the ball end? Not much of it, no. I mean, at this point, I, I look at it from the perspective that we're the regional planning commission. So the issues that we weigh in on need to be or ought to be related to planning for the region with respect to that. Um, so, you know, as these issues come up, I think, I mean, that's the filter through which I look at it, but certainly uh, if, if, if folks feel that there are issues that bear on planning that are more immediate, such as those sorts of things, I think it's appropriate and it's within the scope of um, what we do in our ECOS planning process. And when we start putting the committees together to, I mean, when does that start for the next, though it's a, it's a, length, it's a lengthier period of time now. Oh, uh, for the next ECOS plan update? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I've been interpreting the conversation as like, what do we want to get involved in at the legislature based on what we have in our plan? And which would require probably in some of these cases digging in deeper than our plan goes. Well, I think it's recognizing things that we may not recognize now that might have a bearing yeah. on what our charge is. I think that's more than, more than getting ready to participate in the ball game under the gold dome. I think we just got to know whether or not driverless cars, the evolving 
wireless technology, um, and among other things. Yeah, what was the first item you mentioned? The uh, infrastructure for fossil fuels. I mean, you know, we have a certain yeah. pipeline. Oh, the for proposed ban on gas, and you know, if you're going to suddenly have a legislature that says, oh, we already have it, have it, so. Well, <laughs> you got yours, but I don't know. Does Westward have theirs? Okay. And, and therein lies the rub. Right. Yeah. So all those things, I think, yeah. are reasonable things for us to look at. Well, they're part of energy. You know, the infrastructure and the pipeline is part of energy, as well as driverless cars. Right. Cause oh, and it goes to economic development and all those other things that we address as well. You know, uh, you know, you talk about the deadheading, but an, an idea for uh, wireless uh, for the driverless cars is that they could be on, you know, a very busy loop and you drop people off and stuff so that you're actually saving energy uh, under those conditions. A shared service. Yes. So Eliminating real butt cars. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know, maybe we, I shouldn't belabor this, but I think this, to my sense of where I spend my time, it's it's worth it if it seems like there is something uh, that is going to move through the legislature that's going to impact policy and our future, um, and that actually has a chance to move. So I don't know. I've, I've been trying to follow you know the two major things that I thought were going to move this year or next year. I think they're short-term and long-term issues. Yeah, I, they're short-term and long-term, and legislature is more short-term. Yeah, in my view, anyway, I don't know. I mean, they're a long term. That gets into the idea of are, are we going to try to get in a position of driving some legislation? Mm -hmm. You know, if we're trying to affect policy change at the state level, uh, which is really hard. You know, in a whole different level. Especially from Trinity County. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your comments. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but that wasn't directed at Jeff. That was directed at Trinity <laughs> County broadly, <laughs> and the reaction of the legislature. Uh, but. Um, yeah, so, you know, I guess partly if you all if, or any one of you felt like something was really moving that was going to have a, an impact on us, I definitely I get bring the sense that, that up. it is, but I just wondered, uh, you know, if yeah. we had uh, the wherewithal to uh, begin to take straw polls, map out yep. where we perceive that, you know, the development's going to be, that it's going to get served uh, efficiently and, and within the realm of the next 20, 25 years, you know, rather than... Uh, counting on pie in the sky things because there's no doubt we want core development and we've always spoken to that yeah. and some of the limitations that may be thrust upon you may be counter to that right. uh, and then at the same time you know I, I'm not sure where the 5G is anything to worry about or anything that gets thrown into the mix it's um, it's something I just don't have any knowledge about Chris in the context of our work plan okay we do a financial plan out to 2040 whatever don't you think driverless cars is going to be an issue at some point in time <laughs> that's why in that, on that time horizon? So that's part of our normal absolutely, work absolutely. plan. Absolutely. And I or, absolutely or, agree about the fossil fuel. 5G right. or 6G might be, or maybe 10G. I don't know. The president has a um, unique characteristic of, you know, making stuff happen, even by accident. So, I mean, we just need to, I mean, that's not outside of our time window. To look at those no. kinds of things and things like fossil fuel infrastructure, there are a lot of prohibitions. Ideas you know, are a lot more impactful than fracking bans in Vermont. So, I there mean, are a lot of things are, get brought up. I mean, the whole you know the whole climate initiative that was you know that could be very impactful. But at least my sense at the moment is it's not it's not moving through the legislature. So, just, I mean, we need to develop some kind of approach. <clears throat> for keeping our eye yep. on things that are potentially, um, uh, well, I mean, driverless cars are potentially game changers from the standpoint of all the work we're doing on interstate capacity. I mean, we're doing a long-term assessment right now of our interstate system, right. okay, in, in the county. at a very congested travel corridor. All, you know, we have to be wary of making or recommending large investments where something, some disruptive technology comes in and all of a sudden we've sunk a 40 year investment in that has a lifespan of half the amount of time that we thought it was going to. And we as an organization have a responsibility to our constituent communities and the people in those communities to not do that. You could say the same thing about the energy, the, the solar panels, I mean, you go back to anything, Jeff. You look back 25, 30 years ago and the, 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 the dish, dishes that people were getting internet or TV signals from were the size of that screen or bigger. And now you've got a little tiny dish that's 
a little bigger than these plates, you know, and you're, you're doing things. So that's, that's going to happen no matter what. In many ways, we can look at it. I mean, I, I think you I'm can more say that concerned about, many, about our things. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about transportation investments as a transportation planning body and the things that could come in to disrupt those because those are big ticket items. Right. We are talking but about. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, 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 you know, put so much, uh, uh, value or, or, or credence on that belief that this is going to happen. I, I, I hear you yep. and that, that, that driverless vehicles are probably going to happen at some time in the future. When, who knows, but we know right now we have a problem with traffic in this, in this county. We need to address it. We didn't get the Zurich Highway. We've got Zurich alternatives that are, are stagnant right now in many, many of our municipalities. Um, I want to see that stuff move forward. I, I, I'm, I'm keeping my eye down the road, but I'm, I'm living in today and addressing today's problems without trying to, to you know. My point is we have a fiduciary obligation mm -hmm. to the communities that we serve to do our best to anticipate disruptions going forward. I'm not talking about not funding CERC alternatives. I'm not talking about um, saying that we shouldn't do studies on interstate capacity to alleviate, you know, congestion. I'm just saying that when we do that long-term assessment, we have to recognize there can be some disruptive technologies that might affect our investment decisions within the timeline of that study. Mm -hmm. And we have to do the best that we can, however imperfectly, mm -hmm. to anticipate that, even if we make a mistake. Even if we make a mistake that's two or three X, mm -hmm. we will be better off when we get 30 years down the road having tried to think about that than putting our, our, our heads figuratively. I'm not saying that's right, what right, you're right, saying. Right, right. In the sand and not looking for those things. Mm -hmm. those, are, you know, those can result in unrecognized financial obligations. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily from the standpoint in new investments that we would have to make, but investments that we make in the wrong area that have a 40 year lifespan that may run out in 15 right. years. Well, I think, I mean, and, and the role, and I know Andy has, has brought this up with the executive committee too, is at times we become creatures of what's the next deadline, what's the next thing we have to generate, and we're very reactionary. And then at times we try to be more forward-looking, um, be, you know, a force behind policy change as opposed to just a reactionary board. And there's always a bit of a tension there because on one hand, we have to do the things that are in our normal cycle, things we do, but we don't want to lose sight. We won't want to just become, you know, mechanics. We want to, we want to think more broadly. So I, if there's time on next month's agenda, I think it would be <clears throat> appropriate for us to have a discussion about not only how the commission ought to balance those two things, but also in recognition of what our planning mission is, the reality that we meet once a month, how and what sorts of things ought we to be weighing in on and what's the best way to do that. And that's, you know, that's something I'd ask everybody to sort of, you know, put their thinking cap on about. And I think we could have a really uh, good discussion about, about that. We're uh, planners. Well. We're supposed to at least try to be proactive. Okay. Okay. Yep. Can I go back to my um, initial thing on this about whether we could have a straw poll about whether people think that we would want to support Vermont being a place where uh, driverless cars were tested? Just Why don't you wait? Thing. Can you wait until after Joe's presentation? Because actually, one of the parts of the presentation is is giving. It's a lot more complex. Autonomous vehicles isn't one thing. Yep. It's the technology and the application of the technology. So I think you might benefit from the overview part. Okay. I mean, I, I just I'd have to say I don't know right before now. Well, you. But yeah, yeah, but I mean, I guess it's the, it's just the concept of whether we're open to people coming and you know to to at least someone testing the. I, I'm perfectly willing to wait. I just was curious about. That's just a suggestion. Yeah. I think that's really important. The technology, understanding the technology is a lot of understanding what the what the bill is addressing. I don't yeah. sense anybody being opposed, regardless of what information is provided to us on the topic. Well, it's like John said earlier. John said the whole thing of familiarity brings brings acceptance. Right. Familiarity, what 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 Amy's talking about, getting Joe in here to explain it so we all have a better understanding. Maybe we all. I'd rather 
do that than try and draw a conclusion based on a straw poll to satisfy what you're just curious, <coughs> then to get us educated so that we can we can do the straw poll with, with some education. We're going to do a straw this, poll. We're just right. going talking about the timing. <laughs> okay. We are all curious. Yeah. We're all curious yeah. no, we're and want to learn curious. more. Anything further? Yes. Um, I have an announcement that's actually related to what we've been talking about. Um, we, the university, along with CCRPC and some other partners, are hosting a forum on May 3rd. Um, that is, the theme is using multimodal transportation to meet parking and TDM, transportation demand management challenges on campuses and in communities. It's a pretty broad theme, but the three sort of major session areas are autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles is one. Um, what Vermont's doing to lead the way with transportation innovation. And then the third one is micro mobility and micro transit and how that's used in a rural state. So it's a regional conference. We're pulling from the Association of Commuter Transportation Members and the New England Parking Council members, but it's open to any and everybody that's interested. So it's May 3rd from 9.30 to 3.30. Um, you can come on the UVM website, which is just uvm.edu backslash transportation to see the full agenda. But we would definitely encourage anybody that's interested in these topics to come and be a part of the forum and the conversation. Excellent. Very timely. <laughs> Anyone else got any conferences that would address <laughs> any of the? <laughs> I'm going to move we adjourn before we get too deep. Much OK. Deeper. We have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? second. We've got a second from him. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Aye. Thank you very much, folks.